And today I'm speaking to you from the painting conservation studio at the museum. And typically uh, we would be talking at the conservation window room off the conservation lab here on the fourth floor at the museum. But because of COVID now, we are uh, restricting the use of that space where you talk through an open window, a conservator directly to, uh, to the public. So I'm speaking to you virtually now and, and please feel free to ask questions uh, through the platform that you're using. I'm talking today about the treatment of this wonderful Renaissance painting by Luca Signorelli. It's of the Archangel Gabriel. Um, it was acquired by the museum in 1922 by Henry Walters. And um, it previously was in a collection in Philadelphia. And before that, it was in a collection in Cologne, Germany. And we don't know the provenance beyond that from the mid 19th century up until those, those two earlier collections. So um, uh, let me just tell you a little bit about Luca, Con Luca Signorelli. Um, he was born around 1440 in central Italy in the town of Cortona. Uh, he was a very successful painter. And this is thought to be a uh, self-portrait that was painted by him that's a fresco that's in his most famous fresco cycle in Orvieto, Italy, a beautiful hillside town in central Italy. Um, he was very successful during his time. He was a contemporary of Botticelli and Leonardo and Michelangelo. In fact, he contributed a fresco in the Sistine Chapel uh, where Michelangelo was painting. Our painting is of the Archangel Gabriel and it has a mate which is in a private collection in Switzerland. And this has been, um, this was, was uh, found to be, it's made by scholars, art historians. And we don't know for certain if they once formed part of the same composition or if they were painted separately. So here's another composition by, by Signorelli um, from about the same period. And you can see that it's an Annunciation and you do see that it's an altarpiece with uh, the angel on one side and the Virgin Mary on the other. So why are we treating this painting? Well, we're treating the painting because it's a significant uh, piece in our early Renaissance galleries and it's been hanging for many, many decades. Um, and it hasn't actually been treated, had a thorough treatment since it entered the collection. So that's probably over a hundred years ago. Um, it has a very discolored varnish on it. You can see it, it has a very kind of yellowish tint to it. And here is a detail from the sleeve. And you can see, for instance, um, that over here on this, whoop, here we go, on the white, whoop, my finger's going in the wrong direction. You can see just how brown that white looks. And that's all discolored varnish. And so the, there's a lot of um, discolored varnish on it. And, and it was examined um, by conservators through the years. And people decided not to treat it because they, they realized that there was a lot of damage and a lot of repaint on it. And they just kind of didn't want to go there because it would be an awful lot of work. So um, what we do when we begin our treatment is we go through different types of examination procedures and we look at the painting under the microscope. And when I started looking at the painting under the microscope, I did indeed see that there was a lot of restoration on the painting. So for instance, here's a, a um, photograph from under the microscope and you can see these parallel lines, these diagonal lines, those are painted cracks and the line, the squiggly line down the center is the actual crack. So that's restoration. The, the, the crack was made to look like what might've been the original crack. And also you can see this is in the halo. You can see that kind of shiny gold on top, that's real gold leaf. And then the, the rest of the uh, image there, that's retouching, that's on top of the halo. So it's kind of exciting to see when you start examining a painting like this, 
that there's some really good stuff underneath that dirty varnish and paint restoration. Other methods of examination include looking at a painting under ultraviolet light. And so the ultraviolet light has shorter wavelengths than regular visible light. And here's an image of the painting under ultraviolet light. And what we look for is differentiations, different colors uh, uh, that we see on the painting that are not unified, that are not part of the overall tint. So you can see that there are some, a few darker areas of purple. Um, but the restorations that show on ultraviolet typically only show for about the last 60 years or so. So we don't see an awful lot there. That didn't give us an awful lot of information. We also often take, uh, we look at the painting under infrared. The infrared will show us if there's um, underdrawing or design that's done in carbon. And here you can see in the center of the picture, there's some dark areas. They, they look kind of like drips. That's retouching that probably has some carbon in it. And lastly, we often look, uh, we use an X-ray. And here we have an X-ray, an image of the X-ray of the painting. And it's kind of hard to tell what's going on because you can see there's this, this lattice work over the whole um, image of the painting. And that is because the painting in the 19th century had what's called a cradle put on the back. And let me show you what that cradle looks like. So here's the back of the painting. And you can see that there is this cradle that's been put on the back. It's a, it's a grid. And basically this was put on in the 19th century to the, this, this grid was attached with glue. The, hard, the vertical slats were attached with glue to the painting. And then there are horizontal slats that go through the vertical slats that slide. And the idea was to prevent the painting, the wood panel from moving. This is painted on wood, on poplar. So the original panel, the poplar panel was thinned. And then this, these vertical slats were glued to the back. And then the horizontal slats were slid through. The idea was that the painting would stay flat. And actually what often would happen is the cradle would cause more problems than solve because the painting would still want to move, but the cradle was keeping it joined. Fortunately, this panel is relatively speaking in stable condition. I'm going to start doing some of the, uh, the minor cleaning tests now. So what I'm going to do, re do right now is I'm just going to be removing surface dirt from the painting. And I'll continue talking to you <clears throat> and tell you more about the process, um, about how we go about treating the painting. I just want to start with some of the treatment though first, so you can see what I'm doing. So I'm gonna be removing some surface dirt and I'm using a very mild um, surfactant, triethanolamine, which has a pH, a fairly neutral pH. I'm gonna start in the upper left corner. And when we clean, we always do tests beforehand. And I know from having done some tests that this will not remove any original paint. So here, I'm just gonna put this up against a white paper towel. Oh, can, can you see that? So you can see that I'm removing whoa, quite a bit of dirt right there. And that's just dirt that's on top of the discolored varnish. Um, so before we, we start treating a painting, and what I've done in this instance is we, we examine the painting thoroughly and write up a report. So I showed you some of the techniques we used in terms of examining the painting. And when we examine the painting, we break the painting down into different layers. So for instance, I start at the, at the back, at the bottom, and look at the support. And in this case, the support is a panel of poplar wood that's been attached to this cradle in the back. And that is fortunately pretty stable. Oh, here's some of the really nice dirt. <laughs> so, and then I'm going to rinse this. Um, 
Then we look, we go up incrementally, and after the support, we look at the ground layer. And typically, in a panel painting from Italy, we'll have a calcium sulfate layer that's white or off-white. After that, we encounter the paint layer, if there's no drawn layer underneath. <clears throat> so the paint layer in this case is oil paint. And this was painted, as I said, around 1490. And in the mid to late 15th century in Italy, there was a transition going on from tempera paint, the use of tempera paint by an artist, to the use of oil paint. And tempera is egg yolk mixed with dry pigment and applied onto this ground, this white ground surface. And egg yolk is, as you know, if you kind of left, left a fried egg or anything on your plate, <laughs> Um, for too long, it's very hard to remove. Um, and, and that's the whole idea of, of using the egg yolk as a paint medium. It dries very quickly and, and it's fairly permanent with time. So um, the thing is that since it dries so quickly, you can't really blend your colors without creating kind of a muddy image. So the Tempera paint is often, when you, you can identify tempera often by a very linear type of style of paint, a very linear technique. Oh, here's some more nice dirt. Oop, 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 oop. There we go. Um, the oil paint, and we have oil in this painting here. What you see with oil paint is a much more gradual, beautiful transition. So for instance, if you think of the paintings of Van Eyck in Northern, in, in Northern Europe, there are these wonderful areas of modeling that are very subtle. And you start to see that here in this painting too. This has some wonderful, subtle transitional modeling that you often will not get with the, um, with the use of tempera. So what I'm going to be doing now, I'm going to continue to remove the surface dirt from this painting. And um, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. I'm just going to continue to explain this painting. And what I do is, as you go down layer by layer, so for instance, I'm removing the surface dirt before I remove the varnish, you get a better idea of how the painting was put together. You can more clearly see what's restoration and what's original. All, you always want to go step by step when you're treating an object because you don't want to go too quickly because then you might end up. Um, taking off something that, that you weren't meant to take off because too much is coming up on your swab. So for instance, I might end up taking surface dirt and varnish off, but then there could be restoration that could come off as well. So that's why I just want to go step by step by step using the mildest solvents that work. <clears throat> And the tenet of our of, of modern conservation really is to make sure that the piece is stable. So while I'm cleaning the painting, and that's important to get back to the artist's original color palette or close to it, the most important thing is to make sure that there's not flaking paint, that the paint painting support is not moving. So um, in this case, the paint support is very stable. There, it's basically going to be a surface treatment on this painting. Okay. 
I'm getting a lot of dirt here. Please feel free if you have any questions to just send them in. Often when I'm in the conservation window, people comment, you must have a lot of patience to do this. And I think just like with any job, if you really enjoy your job, you don't even think about something like that. And one of the wonderful aspects of conservation is you often see this great result. So even though you're doing something that takes a long time to treat, the result is very gratifying. I also often get asked, how do you get into the field of conservation? And typically now, people go to graduate schools. There are three graduate schools, four graduate schools. Um, one at NYU, where I went. There's one at Winter Tour, the University of Delaware, State University of Buffalo. And also, um, there's an objects program um, on the West Coast in, at UCLA. And the programs take three to four years, and you typically will do an internship for a year, studying with someone at the end. So already I can see that, and I wish you could see more closely, I'm already becoming more familiar with what's original and what's restoration paint. And typically, and what you see here, the restoration paint is typically much more opaque and it doesn't have the same finesse that you see with the original paint. Now what I'm hoping is that Underneath some of this restoration paint, I'm going to find more original paint. <clears throat> and in the past, restorers very often would blend in with their restoration paint areas of loss over onto the original. So it's easier to just kind of blend and finally find a color that matches the paint loss onto the original than to just retouch that paint loss. So what we do, of course, is we take photo documentation all the way along, the, along with the treatment and written documentation. So for instance, after this painting is cleaned, there'll be photographs taken. <clears throat> so someone will be able to refer back to the photograph and very quickly see what's restoration and what's not restoration. But in, and when we do our retouching, we use a reversible paint medium. Everything that we do in modern conservation, we make reversible. So for instance, the solvent, the, we'll be able to use very mild solvents to remove whatever we put onto the painting. And, um, we only will retouch on top of paint losses and then reintegrate some abrasion. We wouldn't think of blending areas of loss over onto original.
I often will get asked when I'm in the conservation window, how long will it take to treat this? And at this point, it's very difficult to tell because I'm just starting the treatment and I'm not quite sure how easy or difficult it will be to remove the restoration paint and how extensive the losses are. So it would take, no matter what, it will take a few months to at least to treat this painting. And when it's done, it will go back on view in the early Renaissance gallery. I think what we're gonna see when it's cleaned is we're gonna see some wonderful highlights and changes in the color. And hopefully we'll, some of that gold will come out that hasn't been too damaged that's in the halo. Painting feels like it has a little bit of wax over the surface. And sometimes in the past, people would apply wax onto the top of a painting and buff it up to get a nice sheen to it. And of course, the wax just with time attracts dirt and um, becomes more dull.
Well, if there aren't any questions, then um, I want to thank you for joining me today in our virtual conservation studio. And hopefully you'll be able to see this painting back up on the wall in the future. Um, please um, look into some of the other virtual conservation sessions that we have on Facebook and on YouTube. And uh, again, thank you very much.